Stanford University. I'm Karen Cook, the director of the Institute for Research and Social Sciences at Stanford. We host a number of centers and various initiatives in the social sciences, and one of those initi initiatives is co-sponsoring the American National Election Studies, and we have several people in the audience who've worked on that project over the last, uh, I guess, six years now. Um, I think I'd like to mention that uh, Chris Thompson is here, the executive director of IRIS. We have a guest uh, here from Washington, D.C., Howard Silver, who's the director, executive director of, the, of COSA, the Consortium of Social Science Associations. So he just happened to be in town today. So we have a number of D.C. connections in the audience. But our guest today is Kathleen Frankovic, and she was here, I think, almost Five years ago, 2004, at our conference, which was just after the uh, presidential elections at that time. So we're very happy to welcome you back. Um, until last year, Kathleen had major responsibilities uh, at CBS News and CBS News and the New York Times uh, poll division for both design analysis and interpretation of a lot of their election studies. Um, and since we're still reeling a bit from the most recent elections, we're very happy to have her here to try and make some sense of the midterm elections for us, but mainly to talk about the significance of exit polls and how we collect information from people about issues and voting, whether they voted or not, et cetera, after uh, such elections. She has been since 1996, or was until her retirement, the senior producer for CBS News election broadcasts. And before joining CBS in 1977, she was a political science professor at the University of Vermont, having been educated at Cornell and Rutgers. And I believe at Vermont, she directed the Social Science Research Center. She's co-author of several uh, books, all about elections. They have catchy titles, the election of 1980, the election of 1992, and the election of 2000. And they've all been published by Chatham House. Um, and she's also published uh, many articles. One of my favorites is one that she published early on, which I think was one of the first academic analyses of the gender gap, entitled Sex and Politics, New Alignments and Old Issues. Yes. <laughs> She served as the president of both the American Association for Public Opinion Research and the World Association for Public Opinion Research. Um, she's also been a trustee at the National Center on Public Polls and the Roper Center, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the Roper Center. For many years, she split her time between New York and San Francisco, so I think she welcomes an opportunity to come back to the Bay Area, especially on such a beautiful day. Um, but now she splits her time between uh, New York and Hilo, Hawaii, so you're all welcome to visit her in <laughs> <laughs> Hilo. We have an apartment in New York that's vacant a lot. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Kathleen, welcome back, and we're excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now I'm going to put this away, and hopefully it will stay away for a long period of time. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I like talking about exit polls. I've talked about exit polls for the last 32 years, um, defended them at, at various points in time, criticized them at other, at other points in time. And um, I, I do think that um, they, are, they, are a big, they are a big deal, uh, but they are at a crossroads. Um, we are here in 2010 um, when there have been a number of challenges to the polls, um, when there have been a number of, of, of challenges. And that's what I'm really going to talk about today. Um, where are we with something that has mattered so much to us over the last several, several decades? And it's something that emerged from what the news media has pretty much always done. It's always called elections. It's always wanted to say who's won before anybody else has uh, for competitive reasons and also to try and mitigate electoral uncertainty. I mean, you may think about elections these days in third world countries 
where in developing countries where they're, they, it'll take them week to count, weeks to count the results, but there seems to be some exit poll that's been done. And then there's, a count, there's, an, there's an estimate of what the outcome is, and people live with that. Um, and um, the thing about news media in the United States is that they've used available technologies, whatever they are, um, from carrier pigeons for the Associated Press collecting vote counts um, after the Civil War um, to, of course, to computers. Um, I, have, um, I have a very brief little history. Um, you know, in the 1840s was really when same-day voting in presidential elections happened for the first time in most states. Um, and uh, the invention of the telegraph made it very easy to transmit information about what had happened to central locations. The Associated Press is created. It's, it's collecting information for various kinds of newspapers. Some are Democratic in orientation, some Republican. But they are, they are there to tell us um, what has happened. In 1883, the Boston Globe established a, a, a pattern of finding key precincts. Precincts that represented different kind of groups, precincts that maybe put together represented the state, collected information from them on election night, and reported that in the newspaper the next day. I mean, this is, we're talking well over 100 years ago um, with people thinking the same way that we think now um, about data collection on election day. In 1900, um, if you went to New York City, you would find that there were street lights. Um, and beacons that newspapers put out, you would be told if it had, if it pointed in one direction, it meant the Democrat had won. If it pointed in the other direction, it meant the Republican had won. Stereopticons would um, would put up. I have, a, I have an image of that later on. But stereopticons would put up images of um, of maps of the United States and who has who has won those states. And in our controversies about reporting results early, you know, aren't aren't new to us. In 1916 in the election of Woodrow Wilson and Charles Evans Hughes, um, there were, um, because Hughes did very well in the Northeast, um, there were a number of newspapers on the West Coast who in their afternoon edition on election day reported that he had won. Um, he didn't win. Um, and um, I'm dying to get my hands on one of, those, one of those newspapers. I do have Dewey Defeats Truman from the Chicago Tribune, but I'd like to get one of the 1916 ones. By 1920, radio emerges, and so you have instantaneous reporting of what happens. And here's, here's the uh, 1896 presidential election and then a drawing of Hearst's monster bulletin board in New York. You see a map of the United States up above. Um, the New York Times once put up a map of the United States and had lights behind them that would color the states differently once they knew who they, had, who they had gone for, sort of looking very much like the maps that you see every election night, the red and, red and blue ones. Um, and uh, when the um, election was known in 1896, McKinley is elected, was projected up there to the crowd um, that went to um, downtown, or central New York, midtown New York, to find out what was taking place. Well, then we get to television, and we really get sort of advances in, in collecting data on Election Day. In 1952, CBS partnered with UNIVAC, um, and a UNIVAC computer was in a room relatively close to the studio, um, and it spit out information based on an algorithm that had been prepared before and on information from early reporting precincts. Um, it relatively early in the evening said that uh, uh, Eisenhower had been elected, but the news reporters didn't believe that they could say that so early in the evening, so they kind of held back for a while before reporting it. Mike Monorobot was NBC's answer to that. Um, it had a catchier name, but uh, uh, didn't do, probably did about the same, the same things. Uh, by 1964, the methodology for collecting election night data state to state was pretty much settled. There would be sample precincts in a state. Um, mostly, um, those, uh, those precincts would be selected by most news organizations um, in some sort of systematic uh, manner, uh, using probability sampling, not always. Um, in 1964, as well, um, there were um, Threat, there were complaints that news media, the television, projected the outcome of that election before the polls closed on the West Coast. Um, it was a landslide election for Lyndon Johnson. It was very easy to rack up the number of necessary electoral votes for him to win. Um, but what happened in 1964 is something that also is a thread in terms of television news coverage of the election, and that was merging 
um, information and merging sources of information into only one. The News Election Service was created in 1964 to collect vote counts. Prior to that, every news organization collected the votes itself. Um, now, just imagine the magnitude of this and, the, and how hard it would be to collect the information from precincts. And it would also meant that every news organization, every television network had different vote counts. Um, so you could look at something, this isn't an analysis, this is actual vote totals, they'd be different from one network to the other. So the News Election Service got set up so that it would be the sole collector of this kind of data. In 1980, exit polls were first used to project outcomes um, by um, NBC. Uh, CBS didn't do it, which meant that um, we projected that uh, Ronald Reagan would, won, would win after Jimmy Carter conceded. That was a little bit of an embarrassment, but, but um, <laughs> at, at any rate, um, it, uh, it, did, uh, it, it did sort of change things. Exit polls themselves had emerged in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, there's a, a, it, was, it, it had emerged then um, as a way of finding out not just how people had voted, but who those people were and how various groups had voted, and of course, why people did. Um, by 1989, the notion of saving money became a big one, and um, news organizations ceased doing their own exit polls. They formed a consortium. First it was called Voter Research and Surveys, um, and then later it became Voter News Service, and even later it became the News Election Pool. Um, but it was a way of saving money. Now not only would everybody have the same votes, but everybody would have the same analytic information. You would have the same questionnaire, you would, you would, you would have the same data, you would be saved pretty much the same thing, and you would save an awful lot of money. Um, in 2004, we finally see the internet coming into play um, as, as early exit polls leaked out onto the web, giving some people the impression that perhaps John Kerry had won that election. Um, it, um, it, it, has, it's, it changed the rules, and I'll say something about how it changed the rules for us later. Um, but in 2004 and 2008, there was a recognition that there were measurement issues um, and there were methodological threats to the, to the value and the goodness and the quality of exit polls. Okay, what can go wrong with an exit poll? Well, obviously, the whole survey can be, there can be issues in the whole survey process. Um, including questionnaire design, impacting what people tell you, including interviewer weaknesses, because this is, after all, um, an exchange between an interviewer and a respondent. And there can be differential respondent willingness, which can, of course, create create problems. There can also be issues with the voting process. Um, exit polls conducted at the polling place don't do you a as much good when 30% of the vote is cast before election day as they did when 2, 3, 4% of the vote was cast before election day. And finally, in terms of what can go wrong with exit polling, is that we're dealing with a news media that's in financial hard times, um, that has suffered cutbacks, and, and these cutbacks are going to affect anything um, that where, where money, money matters. Um, you know, in, this is, it's, this is one of the few places where we actually are able to look at the quality of the exit polls and, and say something about whether they were good measurements of the vote at the precincts. Um, it's because in most places we can get the vote at the precinct level. And so we can look at sample precincts, we can look at the exit vote outcome, and then look at the actual vote that's there. That doesn't happen everywhere. It doesn't happen in Britain. Um, it doesn't happen in many developing countries. Um, and we have exit polls in countries that are out there, that put out there, and we have no idea if they are accurate. Um, uh, we tend to believe them because we think they must be right, but they may not necessarily be correct. Um, you know, you do exit polling and it's it's, it's outside, it's, it's at odd places. Um, this was a primary in Connecticut in the summertime. So I'm not, we're not, I don't even have pictures of rain and snow and sleet. But, but you know, here's this, you know, here's your, that's your, this one, oh, excuse me, let's. That guy is your interviewer. You know, he's handed off to these people um, questionnaires and they're off there filling them out. But here's another precinct, this is in Alabama. Um, and, um, you know, sort of different, little, not quite as high class. Another one in Alabama. 
This one is in Alabama. Notice it's the Meadowbrook Baptist Church. So, you know, think about where you are voting and how that has an impact on whether or not you're going to be willing to fill out a questionnaire or how it's going to have an impact, in fact, on how you vote. And here's another one um, from, from, from Alabama, a fire and rescue station. You may, may think, make you think differently. Um, there's very straightforward exit polling methodology. It's been in, 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 in use for decades. Um, the interviews are conducted face to face at a random sample of voting locations. Now, when I say face to face, I, I mean the questionnaire is handed out to the respondent face to face. It's not um, a face to face question and answer, it's fill out this piece of paper. Um, interviewers are stationed outside the polling place, occasionally subjected to local laws. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that later and how that's actually not too much of a problem. It's a paper and pencil questionnaire. And the interviewers phone in the data periodically through the day. Um, records are kept of non-response by age, race, and sex. And it's used in making some adjustments. Um, basically, the interviewer notes the sex of the person who's refused, the race of the person who's refused, and the approximate age, under 30, over 60, anywhere in between. Um, it's, they're not bad at, at, that, at making that kind of, 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 um, of correction and making that kind of estimate. But you know, let's look at what, go, what can go wrong and, and how things have changed. Questionnaire design. This is the German exit poll questionnaire, recent German exit poll questionnaire. Um, you know, who'd you vote for? First vote, second vote. Um, you know, male and male or female, um, how old you are, um, what, who did you vote for in the last Bundestag um, election in 2002. There's a lot of stuff here about um, employment because that's, um, that's important. What do you do? Um, are, you, are you a housewife? Um, and, um, and then, you know, your religion um, and, then, and then some other questions. It's a fairly short questionnaire. This is even shorter. This is the UK exit poll from the um, 2005 parliamentary election. It is one question. Now, interviewers do keep track of age and of, of sex and age. Race is less of a, of a question. Um, but they, they swear by this. They swear by this because it's easy for people to fill out um, and because it's not, it's not as intrusive as this traditional NEP national exit poll questionnaire in 2004. It's a lot more questions than you saw in the German version. Um, in fact, um, it goes, it's, they're lettered, A, B, C, D. It goes up to A, D. So that's 26 plus 4, that's 30 items, um, which you could think of as a burden. But, it, but it, it does also make the point how exit polls in the United States really are about analysis. And you want to find these, all these things out. You don't just want to know how people, how people have voted. Well. With problems with exit polls response rates, um, this is the latest US version. It looks a lot more like the German exit poll. And we only go up to the letter S. Um, so we are talking about um, a lot fewer items, fewer than 20 items, um, as opposed to 30 items in the previous version. You're talking also about a smaller piece of paper which looks easier to the respondent than a full 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper. This is more like um, oh, 05 and a half by, um, by, by 8. Um, and, um, and, and this is now. But that does mean that you collect less data. There were four different versions of this. This is the National Exit Poll Questionnaire. Um, it had four different versions interleaved with one another so that you could collect as much information just from fewer people but you got what you, what you thought you, you needed. Um, and this is a methodological concern. What's the best way? Well, you know, we've been experimenting with the size and the length of the exit poll questionnaire for a long time. Um, there were experiments done in 1982 that said this kind of questionnaire was the best, the most accurate, uh, but then everybody forgot about it. Um, and, uh, and, and now it is a permanent change. Um, this was after the 2008 election. It, people decided, well, we really have to go back. Four versions of the national questionnaire. Individual states had from one to three versions. Um, and, uh, and, and that allowed you to get information about California because you'd want more questions, more substantive questions about California. Um, things you really cared about were on several of the versions of the questionnaires. Um, some things were only on, on one of them. Um, so there's one methodological problem. Then we have interviewer issues. And they can extend from simply interviewer training 
to who the interviewer is, how respondents perceive the interviewers, and how election officials perceive the interviewers. Um, it, it, it was clear in the late 1970s, 1980s, that there was an age difference in response rate, um, that older people were less likely to fill out a questionnaire than younger people. And you needed to have the interviewer keep track of who refused so you could do a weighting adjustment. Now, you know, back in the 1970s and 80s, age mattered less in how people voted than it does today. It's a, it's a, it's a correction, it's a weighting correction that matters a lot more now than it has before. In 1989, in the Virginia gubernatorial election, uh, with a black candidate running against a white candidate, um, the race of the interviewer had an interactive effect with, with respondents, with white respondents less willing um, to answer questionnaires um, if black interviewers offered them to that. And that was a very polarized election. Um, that doesn't happen um, all the time. And in 1992 and 1996, for the first time, the partisanship of interviewers was related to the error that we found within the precinct. Um, and you know, not anything purposive, but somehow or other, your young interviewer people assumed was a Democrat and perhaps Republicans wouldn't talk to them. As an example, um, the young old difference in who's, who's interviewing. In 2004, younger interviewers had a lower response rate overall. Um, eight points below the response rate for interviewers who are 60 years old or older. And younger interviewers admitted to having a harder time with voters. Just 27% of them in post-election surveys of, um, of interviewers said that they, um, that, that they thought respondents were very cooperative. Almost 7 in 10 of the older interviewers thought that respondents were very cooperative. Um, clearly, the presentation of the interviewer um, really mattered. And the younger interviewers had a greater within precinct error. Um, this is just the response rates for young and old interviewers. The light blue for voters under the age of 30, the dark blue for voters 60 years old and, and, and over. And as you can see, younger interviewers consistently showed large differences between um, their response rate with young voters and their response rate with old voters. This is 1992, 1996, 2004. We don't really have it for 2000. Um, but that's, um, we're talking about 15 point differences or, or, or thereabouts in response rates. Now, you know, older interviewers may have had a similar pattern, but the gap between the response rate for young voters and old voters was much, much smaller. Um, you know, less than, less than 10 points. And as you see, these are, these are both to the same scale. The, <laughs> there were pretty big differences with old voters and, and, and older voters and how they, uh, how they responded to different kinds of interviewers. So how do you change the interviewing pattern? Well, a longer interview and training period helps. Um, and a focus on how um, you have to sample. You can't just interview people who look nice or people you think are going to fill out your questionnaire. If you're told to interview every third voter, you do that. Um, certainly, um, there were efforts made to hire older interviewers, to find older interviewers, and the average age has increased, so that's a good thing. Um, and there have been extended efforts to allow interviewers uh, to be as close as possible to polling places, including challenging state laws. Hawaii had a state law that said you couldn't exit poll for closer than 300 feet. Now, that's a football field. I mean, you, can't, you can't conduct an exit poll that far away. A lot of states adopted 100-foot requirements. They're gone. The uh, news media is very aggressive at challenging that, um, basing it on First Amendment rights and winning, winning every single one of these, of these cases. So that's a good thing. Um, so that's also brought people closer to the polling place. Um, the, the most restrictive state law at the moment, I believe, is in Minnesota, and it's 75 feet. But everything else, all the other laws that are out there are things like 40 and 30 feet, which certainly are, are manageable. OK, let's get to, to respondents. And this is something that's just affected polls everywhere, including exit polls. Uh, by 2008, the response rate had dropped below 50% at the polling place. Um, it used to be a lot higher. It was just above 50% in 2000 and 2004, and then it dropped. And so therefore, you're dubious that the measurements that you take um, are, are accurate, the within precinct error. Um, you know, this is another picture of, an, of somebody taking a questionnaire. He's sort of over there. That's pretty uncomfortable. 
You know, I mean, it's not as if you can set up a little house and have people come in and, 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 and fill out their questionnaires. You do it, they do it wherever it's possible. So given this, um, it's probably not a surprise that we do get within precinct era. This chart goes um, actually from 1988 to 2004. And this is the average within precinct error. It's signed, so the average favors the Democrats, favors the Democrats all the time. Um, but you know, obviously in 2000 and, two, and 1996 and 1988, this is on the margin. It, it's sampling. It, you, know, you can call it sampling error, you can call it something else. It's, it's not serious. There are two elections where it is serious, 1992 and in 2004. Uh, the 2004 within precinct error was the highest ever, 1992, this is, this is, up, this is not, this does not include 2008. Um, um, 1992 was also very high. Well, that's 2004 is Bush and Kerry. Uh, 2004 is Bush and Kerry, and, uh, and those data that I showed for young interviewers also came from 2004. Um, well, what about after that? Well, 2006, was the first midterm election ever with consistent pro-democratic average within precinct errors. Um, you know, the pattern that, that you saw in 2004, we saw again in 2006, and we saw again in 2008. Um, and this was something that, that went through the entire 2008 election. Um, it, Barack Obama benefited from what well, benefited from it benefited from it in the exit poll, not necessarily in the vote count, um, in all the primaries, and um, and then in uh, in the general election at, at, as at well. We think it's a combination of the lowered response rates. It's also has there's also clearly something going on with Republicans less willing to fill out exit poll questionnaires than Democrats are now. Why should it be? Well, there are a lot of hypotheses about what causes those, those high within precinct errors. Um, basically, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to fill in a questionnaire. That's sensible. That's sensible because it's a, it's a reading thing. You've got to be able to see it. You've got to be able to read it. You've got to be able to understand it. Um, and, um, and exit poll samples tend to have a lot of people with college degrees and more. Enthusiasm also seems to matter. If you're really happy about your vote choice, um, you are much more willing, it seems, to fill out an exit poll questionnaire than, um, than you are if you're kind of wishy-washy about, about your vote, vote choice. Um, I, we noticed this for the first time in 1980, uh, 1980, no, 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 1996 in the New Hampshire primary uh, on the Republican side when um, Buchanan was challenging George H.W. Bush and Buchanan was, appeared to be doing very well in the exit polls, much better than he actually ended up doing. And you know, we kept thinking of all the Buchanan supporters, lock and load, um, really wanted to storm the, the building with their pitchforks. Um, and, and there they were, filling out the questionnaire, while the George H.W. Bush voters may not have cared, but not have been so happy about their choice and didn't fill it out. Um, it's also the interviewer respondent interactions. What's going on when older voters don't want to talk to younger voters? Are we missing more Republicans that way? And then, unfortunately, the long-term impact of the 2000 election. Well, if you noticed in that chart that within precinct error, there was hardly any in 2000. The problems with the 2000 election and the far Florida projection had almost nothing to do with exit polls. Um, but the exit polls took the heat um, for, for what we did. This came from the... Um, uh, GOP on the morning of election day uh, 2006. Uh, basically, beware of exit polls. Don't pay attention to them. Um, there have been, the, the GOP has not done well in exit polls because they're biased, uh, because the predictions are inaccurate. And this goes on and on and on and on, finding people to quote, including Warren Matofsky, I'm quoted here saying something. Um, and, uh, and it just went on and on and on and on. This was basically the Republican talking, part, um, talking points at the, uh, at the 2006 election. So, 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 so you, these things kind of just do, do happen. Uh, there we go, I'm sorry. This Herb Asher is quoted. Um, it kind of it goes, it goes on. Um, and uh, anyway, so. You know, let's talk about enthusiasm as sort of the flip side of unwillingness. Um, it, those high 
WPEs all had high turnouts those years. 92, 2004, 2008, turnout was above 55%. Those other three elections, turnout was just about 50%. And people reported paying more attention to the election in those high WPE years um, than they did in other years. Two thirds of voters in 92 and 2004, 72% of voters in 2008 said they were paying a lot of attention to the campaign. You know, in other years it was fewer than half. So you have these elections that generate a lot of interest, um, that generate a lot of intensity, um, and that seems to make the exit polls look, look worse. There are other correlates. Um, larger precincts are worse, urban precincts are worse. Uh, basically, when the sampling rate is high, one in 10, say, as opposed to one in two, it's worse. Um, precinct partisanship in several years within precinct era was greater in precincts that had lots of Republicans. That's that long-term effect of 2000. And then, of course, the legal difference, illegal issues with, with, with interviewing. Um, if you have to stand far away, you're, you're within precinct era was, was worse. Well, was, uh, was 2010 better? Yeah, actually. That shorter questionnaire um, increased the response rate and reduced within precinct era. Um, reduced it to the point where finally we're back at a midterm election where there was no real signed um, big um, absolute, uh, so no signed error, average error. In other words, you couldn't say this, this the, the calculations aren't finished, but you can't really say this benefited the Democrats a lot or benefited the Republicans a lot. But this was an election where high levels of enthusiasm favored the Republicans and not the Democrats. So perhaps that mitigated the, um, the spread that we had seen before. And um, various organizations, news organizations, conducted pre-election polls, asking people their willingness to fill out an exit poll questionnaire. In previous elections, there was up to a 15-point difference between the willingness of Democrats and the willingness of Republicans to do an exit poll. And that went down to three points in, in 2010. So that's good. I mean, you know, in a way, the nature of the 2010 election was good for collecting data about it on election day. Now, there are other ways. Um, and the German exit pollsters, um, a number of years ago, decided they wouldn't even bother sampling at the polling place because interviewers would make a mistake. They basically would try to reach every voter at various times of the day and just do that. And, and, and they're very happy with that. In the Philippines, up until very recently, they didn't even go to the polling places. Um, in the Philippines, you do get an indelible mark on your hand if you voted, so you can go to people's houses and they can show that they voted, and, uh, and then you can ask them how they, how they voted. And, and in Britain, as I said, you can't check the, the results precinct by precinct. You only get the votes tabulated by, by, con, by constituency. So other people are facing, are facing similar problems. Um, that 2004 problem of the internet, that got solved. That got solved right away. Um, starting in 2006, we don't, it, that's because news people leak. And so as soon as you got data at 1 o'clock, you tell all your friends. Um, and uh, in 2006, for the first time and ever since then, every, every organization that belongs to NEP gets to send two people, and three sometimes, to a quarantine room. They take away their Blackberries, they take away their Wi-Fi, um, and they look at the exit polls. And they study them, and they see if there are any problems. They, uh, they, they then just deal with them, figure out how to deal with problems, and then at, uh, and, you know, at 5 o'clock, we all see it. Um, and you know, by 5 o'clock, there's not a lot of time to leak because you're working on your news stories. And, and it's, it's worked incredibly well. Um, I, and, it, and it's so quarantined that there's a quote here from Dan Merkel, um, who was the decision desk director for ABC News, who said, I was told not to comment on the inner workings of the quarantine room or what happened that day. Um, so there's, um, there's a lot of Coke drinking, Diet Coke drinking, but, but, uh, and, and, and they're very happy. And if you see at the end, 12 not angry statisticians. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, at any rate, at least one of the problems we've been able to solve. Um, so that's the methodological threats. This is now a bigger threat, I think, because it's not solvable. It's that the voting process has, same, has changed, the rise of absentee and early voting. Um, as of now, Washington State and Oregon State essentially have all mail-in voting. Washington State doesn't have 100% mail-in voting, but it's, it's 90%. Um, and, um, and, and you can mail it in as long as it gets postmarked on election day. Um, Colorado, two of, of every three votes are cast early, um, and Colorado's also eliminated precincts, so that if you vote on election day, you go to a vote center 
in a county. You can go anywhere in the county. Now, that really doesn't make it easy for you to make comparisons um, historically. And by 2008, absentee and early voting was 30% of all the votes cast nationwide. And it was more than half the vote in those, um, those eight states. California, by the way, was just under 50%. Um, of the vote was cast before Election Day. And I don't have the totals for, for 2010. Usually what happens is absentee voting increases, or early voting increases in um, presidential years, drops down a bit in, in the off year. And I'm not sure quite what happened. Um, now, that means you have to collect information differently. And, you, and here are some of the changes. In the 1980s, only three states had enough absentees so that it felt it was necessary to do some pre-election phone polls of those people who had voted early. By 2010, there were 11 absentee phone polls, plus a national absentee poll. But you know that certainly didn't provide full absentee or early vote coverage. But at least it was a step in the right, in the right direction. Um, by the way, that national absentee poll also included cell phones. Um, it's a matter of asking the right questions uh, in terms of have you gotten an absentee ballot, have you voted early, um, and then questions, the same questions that exist on the exit poll questionnaire. Um, but, you know, exit polls are only part of the data collection process now. And they're becoming a smaller and smaller part of the data collection process, which means that in two years, and certainly beyond two years from now, um, you may have to rethink how you collect data on, on Election Day. Finally, and this is probably, maybe it's the biggest threat, it's what happens in financial hard times. Um, the networks and the um, Associated Press pooled their resources and started doing that in the late 19, in the 1980s. But even though they pulled their resources and saved money that way, we're now, you know, 20 years beyond that. And the savings of 20 years ago don't look like savings anymore. Particularly in the media environment today, um, it's still an expensive proposition and efforts continue to reduce costs. Um, in a way, it, you've, got, you've got something that people do, um, it, it's become the currency of how we talk about elections, um, but it's not being done pro bono, it's not being done um, for the good of the, of the country. There are, there are competitive reasons for doing it, um, and cost is, is bound to, to be, a, be a factor. You know, and, and as your absentee phone polls go up, the number of precinct samples go down, which means that in a state that you, where you might have had 50 precincts before, now you maybe only have 40, because you've had to siphon off some of those resources for, um, for election, uh, pre-election day polls. Um, there's a contract that was signed in 2009. It goes through 2012. It'll be renegotiated after that. So I think we've sort of hit a, a, a point at which um, it will be interesting to see what happens um, once the 2012 election is over. A lot will depend on how well the exit polls do, um, but, but it also will depend on the nature of, of the media. Um, you know, the problem is, is as you improve methodologies, you also increase costs. Bringing cell phones into the national absentee poll increases the cost. Um, you have to start thinking about whether you use random digit dialing, whether you use RBS, registered, registration based sampling. What's better? What can you afford? Um, and these are hard calls um, that people have to make. Um, and, um, and how do you decide where you do exit polls? Um, you can't just say, you may not have the resources to say we will do surveys in all 50 states. We'll do large surveys in 50 states. Um, you know, in 2010, states that only had governor's races, unless they were really big states like Texas, they might not have had an exit poll. Uh, because from the national news media's point of view, it was the Senate that really mattered. That was the story. Um, and it was nice to talk about the governor's races, but you know, weren't going to do that very much. Um, and in some states where there was, um, you know, somebody was going to win with 80% of the vote, you have national precincts and your national exit poll sample. And you know what? You could live with five or six to make, to make a poll closing projection so people would get the right information. It's, it's not close in North Dakota. It's not close in South Dakota. It's not close in Hawaii. Um, you don't need a lot of data to be able to say that. But you know, you're, not, you're now no longer relying on those exit polls. But the last question that you really have to ask yourself, and we don't know the answer to that, is where will all these news organizations be in 2012? Um, and I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> clearly, there is, um, uh, there's a lot of care and a lot of interest in doing this, in collecting these data. These data are archived at the University of Michigan, ICPSR. 
Um, they are made available. People use them. But, you know, where will we be? And what will happen? So those are that's kind of my um, threats to, uh, to, to exit polling and, uh, and, and where we stand now. So I'll be happy to take questions if uh, there are any. Yeah, Howard. Take it however you like. <laughs> you know, there are lots and lots of, um, of, of, uh, there have lots and lots of cutbacks at all news organizations. And so, you know, this then becomes a piece of this. And, you know, I don't know the answer. I'm not part of that discussion. But I think, you know, we should be aware that, that that's what people are looking at. How do we do? How do we do this? How do we collect this information in a way that's less expensive, um, but still gives us information that we can use, that we, can, we have confidence in? It seems as if when they collect these um, individual uh, questionnaires, they are handed uh, open to the, inter to the collector. And I'm wondering. No, they're put in a box. They're put in a box. They're put in a box. OK. Glad to hear that. <laughs> okay, that was number one. Number two was that um, I believe there was a, 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 an analysis done here at Stanford and published in um, at least the New York Times that suggests that the problem may not have always been with the exit polls, but with the actual um, vote counting the, um, in certain states and dur during certain elections that had to do with whether there was a paper trail from them. Yeah, um, the um, the 2000 election is is of course its own sp its own special case, and and um, you know if you were relying on the exit poll only, um, there would not have been the misprojection in Florida. So, um, so that, and, and when somebody wins a state by you know, so few votes, it's, it's actually pretty much anything can be, can be the cause of it. But no, I mean, I think that when you're talking about the big differences that we saw in 2004, 2008, and 1992, that's not the vote counting at the precinct. That, that definitely is, is, the, is the exit poll operation and its inability to, to measure correctly uh, what's, what's taking place. I don't know. Um, I, I think that there is, there is, you know, it's become the currency of how we talk about public opinion on election day. Um, it, it gives us relatively instant information that informs what commentators say on election night um, and what news reporters say. And it would be a huge loss not to have it. Now, do you substitute big pre-election polls? Do you come up with a methodology that includes maybe impaneling people, calling them back on election day? Do you come up with, a, with, with some other kind of, of methodology? And I think those are, those are really big questions. I don't know the answers to them. Um, you know, um, and, and they are being, but I can say that they are being, they are being discussed. I mean, how do, how do you do this in a way that, that, that will get you past um, the, the problems. Because if, in fact, um, absentee and early voting increases to the point at which it's 50% of the total vote cast, you really do have to reconsider how you collect information um, about the election. And at that point, you've taken into account, um, you've done some, some polling the last few days. Maybe you also collect information about people's intention. I don't know. I don't know. But it can be very hard. It can be very hard. Do you know if there's any, ever been any discussion about the government having a role in collecting other data on people who are voting about um, their, you know, maybe an optional section about race or education or something on the actual You know, they're ballot. selling, selling um, the, the, the questionnaire to people who might be willing to spend money. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> Uh, the answer is is not really. Um, and uh, but you know, the last time I got a call from somebody saying, "Could I ask a question on the exit poll and we'll pay you?" was probably a decade ago. So you know, it's and maybe maybe that's the way to go. It would be different, or we could or we could sell space for advertising on the on the exit poll questionnaire. <laughs> now you'll notice that that one of the things is that we're still talking about paper and pencil. Um, we're not talking about some sort of um, smartphone um, or, or PC 
um, related device. Um, we did, CBS did some experiments with um, a pocket PC. Um, and, uh, and actually, that's where the, those pictures from Connecticut and Alabama came from. We did some experiments with that. It was, it was fascinating. Um, people adapted well to it. If you make it look like a, um, an ATM, people are familiar with that. Um, we were concerned about older voters, no problem. Um, but we also found that we were suffering from the same um, within precinct era that was happening to people in paper and pencil. It didn't, it didn't improve that. It was kind of nice because you had a steady stream of information throughout the day um, because this could be sent to you every 10 minutes and updated. Um, and that was very nice. And it's, but it is really very costly. I mean, if you start thinking about providing this, and four years later, you can't really use the equipment that you used today because it's going to be out of date. She's over there. <laughs> Um, so, so I know Nick Moon um, doing the UK exit poll has, has yep. done a lot of work recently looking at trying to sample the same precincts um, regularly and thus use ratio estimation to sort yeah. of understand how yeah. things are changing yeah. in those precincts as a relative thing rather than necessarily going at the absolute that we try to do. Is that a possibility? Well, is we that do do ratio estimates um, because we can collect the past vote data from precincts. Um, and most precincts don't change their boundaries. From, from election to election. So we have the advantage that he doesn't have, that Nick doesn't have, uh, because he doesn't have the actual vote by precinct. Well, I, I guess, sorry. well maybe, but, but you're, if, you have the, if you have the problem, you don't know whether it's because people really have changed or whether there is error in the, you know, at, at, at 7 p.m. on election night. You don't know the size of the within precinct error. You, do, you don't know, you don't know, and so, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's, um, it's a clever way of dealing with changes in attitudes, changes in composition of the precinct. Because you do have, well, no, in his exit poll, you don't have anything. Never mind. Um, so forget that. You could be. It could be a way of, of, um, of, 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 of collecting that information. But, but um, yeah, when it comes to the vote, we actually know the vote um, in the previous election. So we can model to that. Was there have been any studies about the relationship between the availability of exit polling and voter sentiment, voter engagement? Not the accuracy between hmm. the, the results, but rather, do, does the electorate really want it? Do they want that instantaneous results, and does it have any impact on their willingness to stay engaged as a voter? The, um you know, certainly the political elite and the and the attentive voters the, uh, do do like having this data, um, as you know you can tell by its usage and its over usage. Um, I, there's been no studies doing exactly what you what you suggest, um, and uh, I I do think though that um, if if we didn't do it, people would miss it. Um, it's become part of everything. I, at uh, lunch today at the American Politics Workshop, workshop I referenced a, um, a, uh, a card that San Francisco Chronicle used to have in its places where you'd buy your, uh, um, your newspaper. You put a quarter in and you get out a Chronicle. It's probably not a quarter anymore, but, but um, I'm, I had my husband steal one. <laughs> and it said, the latest polls show that people like to read the latest polls. <laughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> um, there certainly is this expectation that people like this. So, and I think people, people may operate on that, on that even without data. You know, you ask people, and we did this in the 1980s a lot, you know, whether we should be doing this and reporting results, and people would say no. But, and there's also, there also is, is, is a theory that once a network projects an outcome in an election, People switch to other networks <laughs> to see if it's true, you know, to validate it, or or to maybe kind of carry on the excitement of election night beyond um, beyond the, the the finality of someone of someone winning. Yeah. Yes, I had two questions. One was, what was the purpose with these exit polls? Could we survive without them? Are there any other purposes that we don't know of uh, apart from the entertaining? That you oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I would go much further than saying they're entertaining. I mean, I think that they do set the agenda for how we understand elections. Um, if we didn't have them, 
look, if we had to wait for the American National Election Study to tell us what happened on election night, people would be coming up with theories that, that, that might not be true and trying to, to make them so. Um, the, um, you know, I, I remember back in 1980 in the election of Ronald Reagan, and that was a really long time ago, the first election of Ronald Reagan, and um, the Republicans wanted to make the argument that this was a turn to the right. Um, and they would have made that argument, except for the fact that the exit polls clearly showed that a big component of the vote was simply to get Jimmy Carter out of office. Um, so that, yes, there was a slight conservative m movement in the electorate, um, but if you don't have this kind of data, you're actually freeing politicians to make, to make their own claims about, about what an election means. Yeah, we, we do collect um, information in Oregon and Washington all by telephone, all in the few days before the, before the election. Um, it is helpful when there is a clear winner. So Ron Wyden was easily projectable uh, when the polls closed in Oregon, but Patty Murray was not. Even though the polls suggested she had a small lead, you wouldn't do that. Um, you wouldn't do that because you don't have, uh, that's a poll after all, it's just a telephone survey. Um, you don't have precinct information, you don't have any other, other source of information. And in fact, nobody projected P Patty Murray until several days later when she was declared the winner. So it was not RBS then? Um, it was not done, the, the, the network exit polls traditionally are done RDD. Uh, which means you have to do a lot of screening to get to the people who have cast a ballot already. Um, there is a discussion about whether you should be doing RBS um, because it's, it, uh, well, for, for a number of reasons. Should you be using R RBS? Oh, it's registration-based sampling. So you sample from voter registration lists. Um, the difficulty there is that you can't necessarily phone match um, the people on the lists. In some states, in some states they're very good. In other states, they're, they're less good. And you have to go to um, commercial firms to try to get the match to the person at that, at that address. Yeah, yeah, because that's how you're going to collect the data. You're going to do it by telephone. Okay, so let's thank her. And there's a reception. Oh, cool. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.